Hi, so today I wanted to talk to you about linearly squares. So first of all, when do you use linearly squares? Well, if you're performing an experiment where you measure two different quantities for each data point, um, it's often natural to plot the one value versus the other in a plot like the one that you see here on the right. Oftentimes you'll see a, a linear relationship and then what you would need to really truly understand that experiment is the equation for that line. I'm going to stick with the notation that's present in your text for a line, y is equal to a plus bx, just to be consistent with your text. So what you would need to know is the uncertainties in a and b and the values of a and b um, in order to understand that line and the relationship between your data. Okay. There's lots of different computational methods to determine best fit lines. Um, if you're interested in figuring out other computational methods, then you should take our computational physics course here. It's very good. They'll teach you all kinds of numerical recipes. But the way that we're going to discuss in this class, it'll be really the only method of uh, computational uh, determining of an equation that we'll discuss in this class, is linearly squares. Okay, so the method, linearly squares, what it does is it minimizes the y residuals. The y residuals here I'm defining as the distances in y from the data point, um, each individual data point, to the best fit line equation, what that line would predict for that y value. What we're going to do is we're going to minimize the square of all the residuals for all the data points in the line. The reason that we have to square them is, of course, the residuals for a best fit line are going to be just as likely uh, above as below the line. So if you minimize the square, you're truly minimizing the value um, and not going to zero. Now this is one of the fundamental problems with linear least squares also and main assumption of linear least squares. Because it's the y residuals that we're minimizing here, it's important that if you have a data set and you have x, y values for your data set, that your uncertainty lie for the most part in the y values and not the x. Okay? So if you have a data set that you're plotting, what you want to do is plot the value with the largest uncertainty on the y-axis and not the x. You want your uncertainty in your x values to be minimized, okay, negligible compared to your uncertainty in the y. This is one of the main assumptions of linearly squares. And here I show, you know, first of all, how the equation for the line is determined. It shows the residuals in the y direction. And then here I show a sample data plot where the error bars here, you can see, are in the y direction. And that's where you really want to go with your linear least squares. Okay, so here's, I'm going to take you through the proof um, of how we find the constants a and b and their uncertainty. So first of all, you need to calculate your y residuals. So that's going to be the value y minus the value of the data point yi, and that's going to equal to di, which is the term that we've used in the past for our residual. Now y is what value the best fit line would predict for that, and then yi is what the value of the data point actually is. So you would figure out what y would actually be predicted by plugging in a plus b times xi. So then if you find your residual, you'd have a plus b xi minus yi, and that's equal to your residual. Now, this is one of the residual. We need to sum over all of our data points. We're assuming that we have n data points here. And then we want to square those residuals. So it's the sum over i is equal to 1 to n of di squared. And then plugging in what di is, we have this equation here, a plus b xi minus yi. Now, in order to minimize these residuals, um, to find a minimum, we take derivatives and we set them equal to zero. So we want to minimize this for both of our constants a and b to best determine what those constants a and b should be. So we're going to take the partial with respect to a of the uh, sum of the squares of our residuals. We're going to take that partial and we're going to set that equal to zero. And then we're going to do the same thing for b, the partial with respect to b, partial derivative with respect to b, of the sum of the squares of our residuals, and we're going to set that equal to zero. Now these equations, the partials with respect to a and b of the square of the residuals, the sum of that equaling zero, those are called the normal equations. They're often called that. So here on this um, slide, I run through how to find those partial derivatives. So the partial with respect to a of the um, residual squared 
that square is going to come down. We're going to have a 2 out front and then times this. There's nothing else multiplying that a, so the derivative of the inside is 1. Okay, and you set that equal to 0. Since that 2 appears in every single term of the sum and then the sum is set to 0, you can divide out that constant of 2. Um, and then if you sum uh, from i is equal to 1 to n over a, that's just going to be a constant, that a is going to appear n times. So you have n times a plus the sum of b x i, and then I've just moved the terms of y in it to the other side of the equation. And the other thing to understand is that if you sum um, a, this term a plus b x i minus y i, it's the same thing as summing each term individually and adding them together. Okay, now the parts with respect to b, basically the same thing with the factor of 2 and the factor of 2 canceling out. But since b multiplies xi, when you take the derivative of the inside, you get xi. So now we're going to have this xi term appearing in every single term of our sum. And yet again, I move the stuff with y in it to the right-hand side of that equation. So there's our normal equations. Now, this is a system of linear equations. You could straight up solve this algebraically and you're, you would get exactly the same thing as I'm about to show you. In fact, I'm going to leave that as an exercise to you if you want to perform that. The method that I'm going to use to solve it is a little bit more like what your computer would do to solve it. And it's using Kramer's rule to solve a system of linear equations. If you're not familiar with Kramer's rule, I've left a Wikipedia link down here at the bottom for it. Um, and you can access that link and read all about it if you want to. It's something that's covered, I believe, in um, basic algebra classes, maybe in uh, calculus classes. Certainly, it's covered in uh, linear algebra. So if, you're, you know, if you go on and take linear algebra, you'll see this again. But basically, Kramer's rule is put the equations in a matrix, okay? So that you have uh, M R equals P here is what I called it. And M is an N by N matrix with a non-zero determinant. Your vector R is a column vector of your variables. And then P would be what those um, column, is, is a column vector showing what this equations are equal to. Okay. And then if you want to solve for your column vector r, any individual one of those variables r sub i in your vector, then you take the determinant of a matrix which we'll call mi and then divide that by the determinant of m. Now you get the matrix mi by replacing the ith column of your matrix by your column vector p. Okay. So it's best understood when you see the example here. So let me now apply Kramer's rule to the system of equations that I have here. Okay, so here's my system of equations. Na plus the sum of bxi equals the sum of yi. Okay, and then sum of axi plus the sum of bxi squared is equal to the sum of xi yi. Okay, so here's my system of equations. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that into a matrix in the form mr equals p here. Okay, so look, what I've done is I've made a matrix with elements n, sum of xi, sum of xi, and sum of xi squared, right? You'll notice those are the things that appear in our equations multiplying the constants a and b, which are the variables that we want to solve for. Right? Then I have my column vector a and b, and then that's equal to the right-hand side of the equations, which is what we're solving for in a column vector. So that's going to be p here, our column vector p. Now if you do matrix multiplication, what you do is of course you multiply row times column. So doing that, I would recover the equations that you see there at the top. n a plus the sum of b x i is equal to the sum of y i. Okay, so hopefully you remember your matrix multiplication and can uh, figure that out. If not, yet again, you can look it up on Wikipedia, and I think it will explain it pretty well. So there I've taken my system of equations and put it into my matrix form, MR equals P. Now, on the next slide, I'm going to apply Kramer's rule. Remember that the symbol for taking a determinant of the matrix is putting those little absolute value signs around your matrix. So here I have the determinant on top for, for element A. Okay. Um, the determinant of my MI matrix, okay, where I've replaced the first column in the matrix with my column vector P. And then on the bottom, I just have the determinant of regular A. Now remember that to take a determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix, you just multiply um, diagonally. So you do um, the diagonal minus the diagonal. Okay, so that's what I've done here. I've got the sum of yi minus the sum of xi squared. That's multiplying along this top um, diagonal here. And then minus the sum of xi times the sum of xi yi. 
Then I do the determinant of the bottom matrix exactly the same way. So this is going to be my equation for A here in terms of these sums. This is how I would find my value of A from the data. A is equal to the sum of the YI values times the sum of the XI values squared minus the sum of the XI values times the sum of XI times YI, and then divided by my number of data points n times the sum of XI squared minus the sum of XI times the sum of XI. Okay. So you can do that from your data okay, without any knowledge of A before you have it. This is just taken and extracted from the data points. You can do the same thing for B. It's exactly the same type of deal. Here I've just replaced my column vector P with the second column, but yet it's the same thing. So here B is going to equal to the N times the sum of XI of YI minus the sum of XI times the sum of YI divided by N sum of XI squared minus sum of XI times sum of XI. So there's our equation for B. Yet again, you don't need anything except the number of data points and the values of your data points in order to calculate B. So now we have the equation for our line because we have our constants A and B and Y is just A plus B X. Okay, now the next thing that you need to know are the uncertainties in your data. So first thing that you're going to calculate is basically the standard deviation, if you will, of your line fit. Okay, so that's the square root of 1 over n minus 2 times the sum of yi minus a minus bxi. So this right here, this yi minus a minus bxi, that's just your residual yet again. Remember your equation for your um, standard deviation is um, square root of 1 over n or n minus 1 times the uh, the residuals, some of the residuals squared. Well, this is the exact same thing, okay? So this is sort of like the standard deviation of your line. The only difference is that this constant out front is 1 over n minus 2. Why n minus 2? Because it takes two points to make a line, right? So if you only have two points, you're going to get a perfect fit to that line, but you're not going to know whether or not it's right, okay? So your uncertainty should blow up if you only have two data points, and that makes sense. Now, you can use the equations for propagation of error to then solve for what the uncertainty in your constants A and B are. I'm going to leave that as an exercise to you. It's very painful, and I don't want this lecture to drag on um, too long. But I've written out what those uncertainties in A and B are here. So sigma A is equal to your uh, basically your standard deviation sigma Y times the square root of the sum of XI squared divided by delta. And I define that constant delta down here as N times the sum of XI squared minus the sum of XI quantity squared. And then sigma B has a similar equation, and I'll leave that to you to read. Okay. So those are the uncertainties. First of all, the standard deviation of your fit, sort of, and then the uncertainties in your constants A and B. So that's how you do linear least squares. And I think you can see that computers would love this sort of thing. It's just running sums and performing easy calculations based on your data. But I wanted to take you through one example problem here um, that I do more or less manually. Um, this is a problem from your book. I believe it's problem 8.1 from your textbook. So here's the following um, XY pairs, and they want you to find the best fit line using linear least squares. Okay. So here's my data points, and I plotted them here in this um, Excel file. 1, 6, 3, 5, and 5, 1. And you can kind of, if you wanted to, draw that line with your eye and sort of see um, what it would look like. Okay. But we need to do better than that, and we need to actually calculate it. So we're going to do so. So first of all, I entered my data points in columns in this little um, spreadsheet that I copied over from Excel. Here's my X data. Here's my Y data. Now, if you remember our formula for A, you don't need to remember it. Actually, I can pull it up right here. So here's my formula for A. What I have to do is sum um, those values, and then I need also to sum certain other things that I'm going to calculate from the data. Like, for example, I need to sum XI squared, okay, and I need to sum XI times YI, right? So in order to do that, I just went ahead in the columns and calculated the values of X squared and then the values of X times Y. Okay, in these columns. So then I have the sums here. Excel will automatically calculate the sum of a column of data for you, so I've utilized that, right? And then from these sums of these values, I've calculated my constant A. So here A is equal to 7.75 from that. I've also um, looked at my formula for B, 
which I can pull up here for you. The number of data points times the sum of x, i, y, i, so on and so forth. There you go. There's the equation, right? And I've calculated that from my spreadsheet as well. Here, the number of um, x, y pairs that I have is 3, so n is equal to 3. So then I calculated b here, and I get my slope of negative 1.25. Now, from that, I also need to calculate my uncertainty, okay? So to do that, I calculated the residual, okay, yi minus a minus b x i for each data point, okay? Um, so there's my residuals, and then I squared my residuals, and I summed them, okay? And then I did the square root of 1 over n minus 2 times the sum of the squares of my residuals, and that's how I got my constant sigma y. Then I used my formulas for sigma a and sigma b and calculated them, and those are reported in the spreadsheet as well. And so here's what I get for my equation for my line and my uncertainties. y is equal to 7.8 plus or minus 1.5, that's my uncertainty in A, and then minus 1.25 plus or minus 0.44, and that's my uncertainties in B there. Okay, so that's how to do it. It's, it's not hard, but it is tedious, um, and it's easy to mess up when you do it manually. Now, since it is kind of tedious, it's usually better um, when you're doing linearly squares for, for real, for your data analysis in a lab or something, to use some sort of spreadsheet to do it. Um, so I'm going to show you now how I used origin for a linearly squares regression. Okay, so here's the origin file, okay? And here I'm plotting students' homework grades versus their final grades um, for a class. And since, of course, I use the homework grade um, as a percentage of their final grade, it makes sense that these should be linear related, right? So how I do this in origin is I highlight both col columns of my data. You'll notice that in origin, it asks you to specify your x and your y variable, okay? So I've done that there. I've had their homework average as the x variable and their final average as the y variable because I want to show how the homework um, relates to the final grade. So there you go. That's what I've got. I highlight those two columns of data. Then I go up to analysis and then under the subcategory analysis I choose fitting. Once I choose fitting you can see that all these options pop up. You can do a linear fit, a fit linear with x error, polynomial fit, blah blah blah. So these are where your fitting routines are in origin. I'm going to go ahead and choose linear fit. Okay. Once I choose linear fit, it's going to pop up, switch the report sheet, sure, put it on a different sheet, I'm okay with that. And then here's my linear fit um, data. All right, so you can see all these different things, the options that pop up, okay? So what you can do is you can ask it to calculate various things. It shows you the input data, it shows you the columns in the spreadsheet that it comes from, the mass data, bad data, if, you, if you're going to not use that in data points, and we talked about that last week, um, how to get rid of data points. And then it shows you your parameters, your intercepts, your slope, and then the errors in those values. Those are your constant sigma A and sigma B that are calculated from that. It also gives you the number of data points and some things that we're going to talk about later. Um, so don't worry about that just yet. Finally, it pulls up the best fit line. So here, I'm going to um, click on that and show you. Here's the data, and here's the line that it fit to my data. Okay? So this is how you get Origin to do a fit for you. It's, um, it's really not difficult. It's, it's very straight up. And Origin does use linearly squares um, to fit straight lines. Now, you can use linearly squares fitting um, for exponentials. You can actually use linearly squares techniques for um, nonlinear fits if you want to. But with exponentials, it's really easy because all you have to do is take the natural log of both sides of your equation and your exponential becomes a linear fit. So that's pretty straight up. So for example, if you have y is equal to a e to the bx, for example, and you take the natural log of both sides, you can see that that's the equation for a line. So if you want to do that, you just take your natural log and then you can do a normal linearly squares fit to the data to determine your constants a and b. So that's no big deal. There are other fitting routines out there, as I discussed. Least squares is only one method of um, finding the best fit line. And like I said, if you're interested in other um, numerical methods, then you can take our, our computational physics course. 
Usually, um, other methods are used to fit to different functions, functions other than straight lines. There's, there's other fitting routines that might be a bit superior in some ways. However, if you want to, you can use linear least squares method to fit to nonlinear cases like a polynomial fit. So let me show you the polynomial fit and how that might work. Let's say that you have some polynomial that goes beyond first order. So you have y is equal to a plus bx plus cx squared plus blah, 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 blah. Okay. So it's not hard to see that you could take this system of equations and put it in a matrix form um, like we did using Kramer's rule. And, it, and it's not really going to be all that different from what we did for linear least squares. So let me show you how that might work for um, taking something to the squared term, for example. So you're going to calculate the squares of your residuals just like before. I've done that here in our first line. And then instead of taking the partials with respect to a and b and setting those equal to zero, you take the partials with respect to a, b, and c. And you set those all equal to zero. Um, so I've done that there. And then I've developed um, this system of equations, and there's going to be three of them um, here. So yet again, here you have three equations. You have three unknowns. So it's a system of equations that you can solve, and it's not that hard. So I've gotten it into this um, uh, form that one would put it in before they put it in the matrix. Then you put it in your matrix. You would get something like this. And then you would take your three by three determinants to solve done and done. Okay. Now, this would be one way that you could do it for um, nonlinear cases. You don't have to do it this way. There's other fitting routines. Um, if you want to know, for example, what any particular piece of software uses to solve for it, you can always go to the help files and do so. I encourage you, when you're doing a fit to your data, to especially when you get out into the real world into some sort of lab, to make sure that you understand exactly what routines you're using to fit your data. Because if you don't, there might be some underlying assumptions of that fitting routine that your data doesn't uh, follow. And that would be a big mistake and give you a lot of, um, I guess I, could, I should call it, uncertainty or, or systematic uncertainty in whatever you find for your final reported values. So just make sure that you understand each fitting routine that you use when you're doing this on real data and you understand what's going on with it and what its limitations are. And that's the take home message for today. Okay, so thanks and uh, I'll see you in class.